Thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Matthew Wilson. I'm a senior at Princeton. And on behalf of Princetonians for Free Speech uh, and the James Madison program, uh, it is uh, an honor to welcome Judge Kyle Duncan and Professor Robert George for this important conversation on what free speech is and what it isn't. Um, I'll read a brief biography of each of them. Uh, judge Kyle Duncan is a judge in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He received his BA from Louisiana State University, his JD from the Paul M. Hebert Law Center at Louisiana <coughs> State University, and his LLM from Columbia Law School. After graduating from law school, he clerked for Judge John Malcolm Duhay Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Before becoming a judge, Judge Duncan practiced at the Washington DC firm of Share Duncan LLP, where he was a founding partner. He also served as general counsel of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, appellate chief of the Louisiana Attorney General's Office, and assistant professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. He was nominated to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit by President Donald Trump and received his judicial commission on May 1st, 2018, after being confirmed by the Senate. Professor Robert George is McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He has served as Chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and before that on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a Presidential Appointee on the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He is a former Judicial Fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States, where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. He is author of, among many other works, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, In Defense of Natural Law, and Conscience and Its Enemies, Confronting the Dogmas of Liberal Secularism. A graduate of Swarthmore College, he holds MTS and JD degrees from Harvard and the degrees of DPhil, BCL, DCL, and DLIT from Oxford University. On a more personal note, I'm very grateful for Judge Duncan on agreeing to come here. Uh, we arranged that we first arranged this event at a uh, restaurant in the DuPont Hotel in Washington, D.C. <laughs> late last year, sounds and it was fishy. very impromptu. Yeah. It sounds a little fishy, but it was very impromptu. But uh, we are very grateful for Judge Duncan uh, for coming up here. So yeah, take it away. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted and honored uh, to be here with, uh, with Judge Duncan. As uh, Matt pointed out, uh, Judge Duncan, uh, before he was Judge Duncan, uh, worked, among other places, the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty for a couple of years on whose board and executive committee I have long served. So he used to work for me. Uh, I did. Uh, he's argued cases before the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, and I'm sure you'll have quite a career, and it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Kyle. Very kind. Uh, so let me uh, launch right <coughs> into our discussion of what free speech is and what free speech isn't. So I hear people today say that speech is or can be violent, mm. and violence, violence is or can be speech. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how you view the matter, but it seems to me that speech is speech, however vile, and not violence, and violence is violence, however much someone may think it's justified, and not speech. How do you see it? Well, um, it, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here with you, Robbie. Um, and uh, I should say, I, I love coming. This is only the second time I've ever been at Princeton. Um, uh, I, I got into Princeton when I was in a senior in high school. And, and for reasons that still escape me, I didn't come. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and you see what happened with my, you know, who, who knows what I could have done. <laughs> I, I could have studied with you. Um, but it's, it's, so it means a great deal to me to be invited here to, to, to speak. Um, you touch on, you touch on what, the, the key issue that keeps me up nights, which is what is happening to the perception of free speech among a generation younger than I am, maybe, maybe the rising generation. Where are their ideas about freedom of expression coming from? And I really don't know. Social media, the internet, uh, uh, TikTok, I don't know. But they're... They have ideas that seem to be fairly well formed, and you've touched on one of them that troubles me a great deal, which is this idea of harm, that sometimes merely speaking uh, an offensive or a challenging word is so harmful 
that it can be equated with violence. And this, I, I guess I have to take that seriously when someone, if someone sincerely believes that. But the, the point of it, obviously, or the effect of it, obviously, is to allow the government to suppress that speech or even to penalize that speaker. And so the net result of it, if not the purpose of this sort of, uh, this, this uh, I want to say subterfuge, this changing what words mean, speech is violence, violence is speech, is to suppress speech. And to put on the defensive uh, someone who may feel an obligation to say something that's controversial or to say something that's challenging, uh, and so this is a is a extremely a very negative development, um, and it's it's troubling. Um, it's it's hard. I, I put it this way when I and I, I'm often speaking of it for you know because of the Stanford thing. I'm often find myself in the position of being at universities and speaking about free speech, and the way I, I often put it is that look, I don't want to denigrate what the rising generation thinks about free speech just because it's different from what I think. But as a professional, as a judge, and before that as a lawyer, um, I was sort of doing free speech as part of my job. And so that requires me to understand what is in the mainstream of our American tradition of free speech. And I will say that this, this, this idea that speech can be violence and violence can be speech is really fighting against some of the core tenets of our American tradition of free speech as it's developed in the world of ideas and in the world of jurisprudence. And, and so I'm, I'm troubled by it um, because, you know, if you look at sort of some of the currents of free, free speech in the early 20th century when Justice Holmes was writing dissents in cases like Schenck and Debs and these, these cases Holmes where... Holmes and Brandeis. Holmes and Brandeis were writing dissents and saying, no, no, you know, Eugene Debs is running for president from jail, as I understand it, because he Socialist was, Party candidate for yeah, president. And, and, and you have Holmes saying, no, this is, we, we, we shouldn't do this. It took, and I haven't studied the history in great detail, but it, it, as I understand it, it took until a case like Brandenburg versus Ohio in the late 60s to really vindicate a robust idea that no, we do not punish speech, even if, even if it has the propensity to eventually lead to unrest or, or even violence. We don't punish the speaker. Our remedy is more speech, um, not to punish the speaker. Even so much so that Holmes's famous clear and present danger test was, I think, in the view of people like Brennan and Douglas, not speech protective enough. And so we have the modern day cases like Brandenburg uh, on incitement. And that, that represents, I mean, we, we, certainly, certainly we can criticize or, or, or d d discuss how we got there. But those are very, very speech protective cases. I mean, you look and I tell audiences this, especially with high school kids whose views on free speech are just baffling to me, including my own children. Uh, you know, I ask my children at the dinner table, dinner at my house is a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> when um, when uh, I ask my children, so, so, because they see their dad in the news and they're like, what's, why, dad, could you get out of the news, please? Um, and I say, to my 17-year-old, so it's very well educated. He's in a great school, uh, and I say, uh, Thomas, do you think that if I walked out on the street and I called somebody a racial epithet, which of course I'm not going to do, and you shouldn't do it either, but what if I did that? Could that person call the police and have me arrested? And he thought about it and he said, maybe so. And I said, well. And then dad launched off into a lecture about Brandenburg versus Ohio, and, and, and dinner was, was over. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that when, when I'm talking to high school students, I say, consider this kind of speech. And I go through the speech in Brandenburg, which is this horrible racist rant by a Ku Klux Klan rally that was broadcast on a local television channel. It was all sorts of racist things and sort of veiled threats about violence. Or then I, then I, I talk about the modern case of Snyder versus Phelps. It's the, um, uh, what was that church called? The, the um, Westboro, Westboro Baptist, Baptist Church um, um, protested a funeral, said all sorts of vile things about uh, the family of a um, young man who'd been killed in Iraq or yeah. Afghanistan. And, and yeah. this is a family that made sort of a strategy 
of doing funeral protests of that nature. And they were very, they were very smart about it. They did it just so that they, they, they were sort of within the government guidelines for where they could speak and where they couldn't. But their speech is horrifically offensive. And I point that out to audiences to say, look, this is, I can't think of speech more offensive than the speech in that case. And I happened to be in the Supreme Court when that case was argued by a member of the family. And, and so I, I, I tell high school students sort of what the speech was with this awful, horrible speech about God is punishing the United States for all these sins, and it's punishing the United States by killing soldiers like this soldier whose grieving parents are at the funeral, and they're you know, sort of near the funeral but not at the funeral. It actually wasn't a criminal case. They right. were prosecuting right. a right. civil cause of action. Exactly. Uh, I think it was intentional infliction of emotional distress. Exactly. And that, that's, that, that is a distinction, but still the idea was can you sue them uh, in tort for this offensive speech? And I asked the, the, the high school audience usually, who do you think won that case? And, of course, the family, the offensive speakers won that case eight to one. Uh, only Justice Alito dissent, a very impassioned dissent that had to do with sort of whether that speech was really focused on the public interest or whether it was directed towards the family. The point being, and this is a long way of saying, we in the United States over the course of many decades have, I thought, arrived at a consensus that we protect even the offensive speech, even the racist speech, with, with some exceptions that we can talk about, even the hurtful speech. And we've decided that the, we protect that speech, not because we necessarily like it, not because it doesn't harm people, not because it doesn't make people angry, but because there are other, we would sacrifice other values, we would sacrifice other freedoms if we didn't protect that speech. And we've said the remedy for that is more speech. And yet, I'm, I'm worried. I'm, I'm worried. More speech in the sense of counter speech. Counter speech. So if you don't like what the speaker's saying, you don't throw them in jail or subject them to a, uh, money damages. You respond to them. You, you, you counter argue. You say, no, this is why that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you, you, throughout your career, have modeled that, that kind of dialogue so well. And I've seen you do it so many times with keep, and keeping a cool head with people who are saying all kinds of outrageous things and you're meeting it with reason and modeling how to do that. Uh, I remember seeing you at the University of Mississippi when I was teaching their involvement. So some issue about, I forget if it was embryology or some, something, IVF, something. Mm -hmm. uh, and modeling that. And that's what we need to be modeling in schools. That's what we need to be modeling in law schools. Uh, that's, that, that, that's what we need. That's, what, that's how we need to be molding the character of our nation as a people. And yet, if you make this move to speech is violence and violence is speech, where are we going? We're not, I think we're not going in a good direction if that's where we're going. When you uh, said that dinner at the Duncan House is, uh, is fun, I was thinking, well, down in Louisiana, what's fun? The eating alligator or something? something well, like that. We, I mean, that, that is, I mean, alligators are violence. <laughs> uh, alligators, alligators are not speech. And we try not to eat alligator. I, I don't like to eat things that want to eat me. Okay. Although I, I, it, it happens to be Lent, and of course, Louisiana, uh, uh, Part of Louisiana is largely Catholic, and I, I did notice that the Archbishop down there has declared the alligator to be fish rather than meat for purposes of abstinence on Friday. Yes, yeah, so. I've, I've, you, you are, you are not wrong. <laughs> uh, you know what you've experienced there with your your son. I have experienced very often in recent years in my civil liberties class. Actually, I'm teaching it this semester, and this morning our discussion, the topic for our discussion was freedom of speech. Uh, some, some of the students may be, uh, may be here, although we worked them pretty hard today between the lecture and precept. We had Jim Weinstein from uh, Arizona State University, uh -huh. the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law, is visiting this year at Yale, uh, give a guest um, uh, uh, lecture. But he uh, made the point that under our jurisprudence, and this is really unlike the law in most of the developed democratic countries, under our jurisprudence, there is no exception to free speech principles for so-called hate speech. The category does not exist. Racist speech, anti-Semitic speech, Islamophobic speech, vile speech of every sort is actually protected under our First Amendment. What I sometimes do, I didn't do it this year in, in the course, sometimes at the beginning of the course I'll just ask students, uh, tell me whether the following uh, are regarded in our jurisprudence as unprotected speech. Defamation, 
And the answer is yes, that is unprotected speech. There's a little wrinkle there because of a case called New York Times against Sullivan. Well, right, right. But it's, but it's unprotected uh, speech. Incitement to violence. If it's imminent violence and deliberately inciting imminent violence, that meets the Brandenburg yeah, standard, that's, that's Brandenburg. and then th that's not protected uh, speech. Uh, false advertising, mm -hmm. uh, fraud, uh, criminal conspiracy, and the students will all say, yeah, no, that's unprotected right, speech. Right, right. And then I'll say, hate speech. And most of the students will say, oh yes, that's mm -hmm. unprotected speech, mm -hmm. and it couldn't be more wrong. So I don't know what's going on in civics classes in high school. I don't know, you know why students come in believing, picking up somehow out of the ether, that there is a hate speech exception to the First Amendment. There actually is no hate speech exception. No, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you say it exactly the way that, that I would say it. It is a category of speech that's unknown to our law. Um, the closest, and actually my son, who's, who's unfortunately actually prepared for these discussions, <laughs> brought up Bo Harnay versus Illinois, which is oh, a 50s case. Yeah, and group he, he libel case. He kind of stumped me on that. And he's like, well, what about group libel, Dad? <laughs> you know, I don't think he wants to be a lawyer, but he might do well. And I said, well, it's hard. So I remember that case, and that's an interesting idea. Well, you're not, you're not libeling a person. You're libeling a group of, and saying, ascribing certain characteristics to a group. And could you criminalize that? And I was like, oh, gosh, where are my law clerks? They, they can tell me why that's no longer good law. My, my sense is that that's, that's law of the past. It's, it's never formally been overruled, uh, and so but is it, it is dead letter. Yeah. I, so I this is the know. idea that you can be held liable in money damages for uh, a libel directed not at a particular individual. Uh, you know, Judge Duncan lied on his uh, financial disclosure exactly. form before, exactly. you know, for when he was under his confirmation hearings, but rather, you know, a libel of a group like, uh, you know, uh, uh, all Catholics are out to destroy the liberty of other people. Right. Exactly. Um, the Beauharnais case said, yeah, there could be a legitimate group libel uh, claim there. Uh, and although the case, as I say, hasn't formally been uh, overruled, it's regarded as yeah, a dead letter. Yeah. That like was the, Lochner against New York. Like Lochner, yeah. yeah that, that was the best I could do at dinner um, to, to say, I don't think that <laughs> could be applied. I'm, I'm not going to apply that case. Um, uh, the other was the, the RAV versus St. Paul case. I don't know if it... It's cross burning sort of, on a, on the, before the home of an actual family. Yeah, cross burning, but as I recall, prosecuted under sort of a proto-hate speech kind of statute. And it's a very complex decision from Justice Scalia explaining why it's, I forget if it's facially unconstitutional or unconstitutional as applied. But that's about as close, Beauharnais in that case is about as close as we've had, I yeah, think, I think, to having a hate speech sort of category. Yeah, but there it's really a kind of form of directed harassment. Yeah. You contrast that with the famous Nazis in Skokie right. case. I mean, clearly, the, uh, if, if those of you are familiar with the case, it split the ACLU, caused many, because ACLU defended the, the right of the Nazis. They weren't defending the, what the Nazis were saying. But the Nazis actually decided they would march specifically through a neighborhood in Skokie, a suburb of Chicago, Illinois, specifically because there were Holocaust survivors there. Yeah. And obviously this would traumatize people who'd been through hell. Obviously, yeah. Uh, so that, that was an, in, you know, an interesting uh, challenge there. But what the, you know, the position the ACLU took, which was vindicated in the courts, it didn't go all the way to the Supreme Court, but right, right. was vindicated in the courts, was that the Nazis do in fact have the right uh, to march and the, um, the fact that the victims would be re-traumatized uh, did not outweigh uh, the free speech uh, interest there. That case, like the Brandenburg case, very interestingly, uh, the 1969 case that established this extremely high standard for incitement to violence. It's very hard to convict somebody of incitement. You notice that's not among the 91 counts against Donald Trump no, despite it, yeah. his speech um, on uh, uh, January 6th. Uh, uh, the reason it's not there, no prosecutor is bringing it, is that nobody can meet the, it doesn't meet the Brandenburg uh, uh, That's right. uh, standard. That's right. Uh, so it's a, it's a really tough uh, standard to meet. Well, um, but back to hate speech. So it's, <clears throat> it's a dialogue with young people that I really need to do more often because like you, the, the typical answer is, well, why in the world would you not allow society to criminalize or at least penalize hate speech. Surely, I had, I had a young lady yesterday who's a, the editor of a newspaper uh, at, uh, at Villanova, and she was very smart, and she said, but look, 
So my, my, first, my first reaction to that is, well, look, when you say this, we should penalize it. Imagine you are giving the government, whatever government it is, the state government or the federal government, the power to define what it is, hate speech, and then penalize you, let's say, and let, not, not, not 20 years in jail, but 10 days in jail or a $100 fine. Do you want to hand that power to the government? What kind of society would we have if we did that? How would it affect our interactions as people? How would it affect the way our, the character of our people is developed if I'm thinking, well, I could get into a robust discussion with you about something very important, but if I say the wrong thing, and you, it, it falls within the definition of hate speech. And she said, very thoughtfully, she said, well, surely there are certain things that you and I could agree to that are hateful. And I said, yeah, absolutely, sure. We could, the, the speech in Snyder versus Phelps, I think, is hateful. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a very broad way, very, I, think, I think it's very hateful. And so she says, so why can't the government do that? Why, what's wrong with it? And you know, it's, it, my instincts as a, as a, as a, as a lawyer um, and now as a judge is to sort of recoil from that and say, no, no, we don't want that. But it's difficult, I find, to explain to a young person whose thoughts about these issues are not being formed by reading judicial opinions or not, they're, they're not in your class. They're getting their views from where from I don't either, know, yeah. from, from the atmosphere. Yeah. And, it's, and, and, and yet they all seem to go in a similar direction. You know what uh, is very interesting to me is that if you look at the, those cases that establish the jurisprudence that does distinguish <clears throat> us from yep. France or even, even Britain, yep. uh, Germany, Italy, you know, liberal democracies, one counter argument to your view and mine would be, well, look, you know, Somehow they don't fall into tyranny in Britain or Germany uh, or, or, or Italy, so maybe we, maybe democracy and freedom could survive in America even if we had hate speech laws. But my point right now is that those, that regime of highly speech protective law, ensuring that no official high or low uh, can suppress speech, was all put into place by what were regarded in their time as liberal jurists. It was Holmes and Brandeis in the early period. It was Marshall and Brennan in the 60s. It was Marshall and Brennan who gave us Brandenburg. In my lifetime, and I think even in yours, free speech of that robust sort was regarded as a liberal cause. Yes. Conservatives, in some cases, you know, were along, but they weren't in the leadership. And in some cases, they were opposed to it. They thought it was just too broad, too speech protected. What's interesting about our present moment and the generation of students that I now see coming through is that it's flipped. That robust regime of free speech law put into place by Brandeis and Holmes and really by Marshall and, and uh, Brennan and the Warren Court, that regime is now regarded as conservative. And the position of the progressives is to suppose, you know, well, that goes too far. You know, maybe, maybe we should have more room to protect speech, prote I'm sorry, to protect people against harmful speech or, or really upsetting speech? Well, you know, I was on a panel the other day at Catholic Law School in DC, and we were talking about free speech and specifically in the, in the context of the university and academic freedom. And Nadine Strassen was there, mm. uh, the, I guess the former head of the ACLU. That's right, uh, who, who, who was uh, uh, involved in the, you know, the decision uh, as a matter of principle, uh, being Jew Jewish herself, yeah. but nevertheless said, you know, we've got to defend the rights of these vile, horrible Nazis. Right, and, um, and she came up to me afterwards, and, and, and I, I just, we didn't talk long about things, but I just got, I got, I got a different vibe from her. I got, okay, here's an old school liberal. Mm -hmm. Here's yeah. somebody who sees, I'm gonna protect your right to say things that I don't like. Um, and I'm going to do that because I, and, and the way I view it is, I don't want to live in a society that punishes you for saying that. Um, is, it, is, it, is it purely instrumental? I'm worried that the shoe will be on the other foot one day and somebody might want to prosecute me for saying things that they don't like. Maybe not. Maybe there's more of a principle to it that I just don't want to live in, in that In Nadine's case, it's certainly principle. Yeah. I mean, I happen to know her, and it's not just that she's worried it's going to happen to her. I mean, it's what she 
right. believes right. as a matter of strict uh, moral principle. Right, but as you say, it, it, I don't know if it's totally flipped. I mean, the ACLU just defended the NRA in a speech case on Monday yeah. in the Supreme mm -hmm. Court uh, that, that had to do with, um, I, I, it's, a, it's a speech case about, about sort of warning away businesses from doing business with the NRA and, and the, this sort of thing. And my what a, the accounts I read from the from the uh, from the argument is that the justices seem to be on the NRA's side uh, with respect to the free speech principle, but I don't understand the the flip as you say because I see that as well that all of a sudden or over time the idea of robust protection for offensive speech has now become a conservative. Yeah, idea. it's strange to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I smarter people than I. Um, hopefully will, are writing about this and can explain it to me. Uh, the reason I'm concerned about it is because there, the, the law of free speech, I don't know if you agree with this or not, it, it's not a law that seems to me to be driven by sort of originalism, original public meaning of the First Amendment. There are some cases where the justices will argue about original public meaning. I'm thinking of McIntyre about anonymous leafleting. But by and large, what the justices are doing are applying precedent. Um, that has developed over time, and underneath that precedent are certain large ideas about the utility of having free speech. So your, your Holmes' marketplace of ideas, or the idea that we are a representative democracy, so we have to be able to talk to each other in a somewhat unrestrained way in order to govern ourselves. Yeah, the nickel John argument. Yeah, that, Alexander yes, Nicholson. that's always, that's always been, been a very powerful argument for me. But there's nothing that says that those ideas are going to continue to hold sway and continue to inform the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. I, currents of thought can change. Um, and we could have a different free speech law in 20 or 30 years or 50 years. Oh, well, that's certainly true. Um, as I understand the critique from the left now of uh, this regime of law, uh, robust free speech protection, um, as articulated, for example, by critical legal theorists, uh, in, including, to get more specific, critical race mm -hmm. theorists, critical mm -hmm. gender theorists, and so forth. Uh, it's a critique of what they call legal formalism. Legal formalism is the idea that the law should be the same for everybody. It, uh, there, you, it shouldn't <laughs> distinguish among people or classes of, uh, of, of people. Equality is equality. And the critical legal theory response to this is, well, no. Um, and that's because people in society have different degrees of power and privilege, or mm -hmm. they lack power uh, or privilege. And so formal equality produces radically inegalitarian, unequal results. So to suppose that uh, you know, the homeless person on the street uh, and Elon Musk uh, should be in the same position with respect to free speech, that is, this robust protection of free speech, overlooks that power and privilege differential. Mm -hmm. And to rectify that so that we get something closer to egalitarian results, we may have to, with respect to certain classes of people, the privileged, the powerful, place restrictions on speech to equalize the overall uh, situation. There's an early articulation of this idea in the thought of Herbert Marcuse, mm. um, uh, especially in his essay entitled Repressive, Repressive Tolerance, Repressive, yeah. Repressive Tolerance yeah. which I think has had a really quite a profound mm -hmm. effect. It was, uh, it was taught to my generation of students in the, um, in the 70s as a kind of fresh, new, exciting uh, angle on, uh, on, on things and I think uh, didn't go out of fashion. Uh, it grew, actually, in its influence over time. It doesn't look like a period piece. It doesn't look like something from the 70s. Uh, it, you know, it, he keeps coming up in things I read. I've been uh, some, reading some Carl Truman. Oh, yes. Uh, and then yeah. Car Carl has a whole uh, chapter on Mar Mar Marcuse. Uh, and he comes up in, I, I, I forget in what other context, but he, he and, and I have never read any, any Marcuse directly. Uh, but he seems to be a thinker who keeps coming up. Well, this, I think, is uh, an argument that does have to be addressed. Yep. Um, f you know, is it, is, it, is it just socially uh, useless or worse than useless, so socially bad, 
uh, formalism that fails to recognize that giving everybody the same free speech rights, regardless of power and privilege, will simply serve to benefit the powerful and privileged at the, expe at the expense of the relatively powerless or, or uh, underprivileged. Um, should, should you as a judge take into account the race, ethnicity, economic standing, uh, minority status in one way or another of litigants when it comes to well, power and privilege. The, the, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm, I'm used to thinking about this kind of repressive tolerance argument in terms of maybe government benefits or affirmative action, these sort of, these, mm. these sort of you know, race-based benefits, maybe, uh, maybe election cases about redistricting and, and all sorts of things. But, but in terms of speech, I'm, I'm honestly not used to thinking about it in those terms. But I can see the argument. Um, now, from my own perspective, an argument like that fights against very, very basic notions of equality that have to be paramount in our law. Um, and the idea of applying a, a, a regime of free speech that is somehow weighted along the lines of, of call it privilege, call it ethnicity, call it, I, I, I don't know, I, that, that makes me queasy. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know, I don't know what standard I was. I, I mean, I'm I'm not using it, the standard of equality. I've departed from that. Now I'm looking to something else. Um, I don't know how that would work. You might call that something else equity. You might, you yeah. might, and that's a that's another tr that's that's another troubling term. Much like speech is violence, violence is speech. When people just take a couple of letters out of equality and you get equity, and I'm no longer sure what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, it seemed that we, it's, you, you, it's sometimes it's advertised as we're making a very small step away from equality or it's a refinement of equality, but then I get the impression that we're actually stepping into a different world altogether where the scales are weighted in a very different way and I'm not sure how they're weighted. Um, asking a judge to apply that is, uh, is very, very troubling to me. Um, I can't, it, it, almost, it almost indicts me. I mean, hey, I'm white, you know. Am I privileged? You know, am I privileged because of the color of my skin as a judge? So what, what does that say about me? Uh, am I, do, do, do I have to now explain before I judge a case sort of what my background is? And where, you know, I mean, I, I'm hesitant about doing that because it personalizes judgment. Yeah. The, the, the symbol of legal formalism is Lady Justice, and Lady Justice has a, uh, what do you call that, a blindfold, blindfold. Uh, over her eyes so that she doesn't know anything about the identity of the, of the, of the litigants. But I think from the critical legal theory uh, point of view, that's a willful and destructive violence that only tends to reinforce the power and privilege relations of the, uh, of the society. But I think it is a giving up on, to use, to use this in not, uh, I'm going to use the term liberal, a giving up on liberalism. But I hear him using the term liberal not to distinguish, say, you know, uh, uh, Teddy Kennedy from uh, William F. Buckley, but rather to mark that uh, tradition that goes back to the American founders or, you know, even earlier figures through Tocqueville. Uh, the, the liberal in the sense that we use the term when we're talking about liberal democracy. Yeah, the root of, is it freedom, yeah. free, as, as opposed to autocratic or even aristocratic, if you think about Tocqueville. But I suppose if you value equity more highly than liberty, then um, obviously since you value it higher, you're more willing to sacrifice at least some measure or some particular right. liberties for the sake of justice, that is, equity. Yeah. The, the, the application of that, I, ne I need to think more about this. The application of that in the speech context is uniquely troubling to me, mm -hmm. I have to say. Um, more than it would be in the racial preferences? Uh, in in a sense, yes. Affirmative action? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. More, more, more troubling than that. The free, free speech, although obviously equality and racial equality is extraordinarily important and, and formative of our nation uh, in, 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 in our law, in our, in our law and our culture. But when you start striking, when you start telling people they can't speak or their speech needs to be curtailed, 
you are pressing on a sensitive part of our representative democracy of our society that is it, it's it's the one where there's there's a there's a theory about free speech the safety valve theory i forget who came up with that i used to when i was at columbia i was reading all these different theories of free speech like and the idea is if you tell people they can't speak if you they, 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 can't, they can't have their say. They can't get out what's in them. They can't express their anger, their disappointment. And they get angry. And this, the pressure begins to build. And so sometime, someday it'll explode. And that's a theory for letting people have their say. You know, even if they say, even if they say outrageous things, like there's only two sexes. That could be regarded as hate speech in many quarters. I use that example sometimes when I'm talking to young people. Do you think that's hate speech? I mean, you wrote a book about marriage. Is that hate speech? Right? One man, one woman. Is that, is it? I mean, there's, to me, there's a, such a huge difference between saying, Professor George, your book, what is marriage? Nonsense, right? Just trash, totally disagree with it. No one should ever read that. And here's why. Here are my 10 reasons why. And then you come back with your... Not, not having read the book, yeah. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> well, that's my... Um, yeah, I get it. And then you and have... It's another thing to say it's in totally, the author of that totally book should be thrown in jail. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Or, or, you know, we shouldn't sell that. I mean, that, uh, should, right, that, yeah. that shouldn't be available. Uh, we to, right now, we, right now we, we, we like to talk about book banning. And we have cases in our court, which, of course, I won't talk about. Uh, on quote-unquote book banning. And this is another term that is thrown around speech is violence, violence is speech, equity, book banning. We're banning books. One side of the political spectrum wants to ban books. And I think, okay, really? We have banned books in this country. Well, there's all sorts of displays and libraries to show banned books and everything. And, uh, you know, to, to, to think about what it would really mean to ban a book in the United States. What does that mean to ban a book? Sounds awful. Should we ban your book? You know, no. Sh no. <laughs> right? You should read it. Uh, yeah. I have read it. Yeah, that, good. Good book, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to say, it. yeah, you're not allowed to have <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's a lot of hypocrisy and bad faith in these allegations of book banning. I mean, it's just clear. I mean, um, Often the discussion fails to note where the books are being disallowed, like you know, kindergarten class or the, you know, the library of, a, of an elementary school or something like that. And of course, there are plenty of people who uh, have argued for banning and have, in some cases, banned Huckleberry Finn. And that's actually not the people who the library associations are complaining about. What, oh, gee, I wonder why. Uh, and the answer, of course, is purely ideological. So um, it's, it's hard to take that whole, honestly, it's just hard to take that whole discussion seriously. Well, and, and yet, um, and yet, no matter how, I, I have to take it seriously. Do you know why? Yeah. Because those sorts of arguments show up in legal briefs yeah. that are filed in my court. And so I have to ask myself, well, what, what, do, what do we mean by that? And what's the legal, what, how does the First Amendment apply to so-called book bans? Um, Actually, when you look at the Supreme Court cases, there's very little on that. There's very, very little on, on sort of access that, to books and libraries. There's a, there's a case about internet access in libraries from, from the to early 2000s. There's a few, there's a, a, a Brennan a plurality opinion from the 80s about school libraries, I think. Uh, there's very little on that. And yet, those issues are popping up everywhere. They're popping up in my court and they're popping up in other courts. And at some point, the Supreme Court will have to tell us, you know, how the how the uh, how the First Amendment applies, and and that raises another question. These days, you have First Amendment issues, free speech issues, that are arising in contexts that have almost no precedent on them. I'm thinking of social media. The Supreme Court heard a case this week out of my court, which of course I will offer no comment on, uh, about the federal government allegedly. Uh, coercing social media companies to take down posts. They heard a case uh, earlier this term, uh, also from my court, about whether a state can regulate. Now, my court doesn't moderation. mean necessarily that Judge Duncan had the case. 
It means it was in the Fifth Circuit. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, and it also doesn't mean that I own the court. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because if I own the court, then I would give everyone a raise. <laughs> um, uh, no, we just, we, we judges because we, we don't have anything of our own. We call it our court. Um, but these are cases, and without, of course, without me saying one way or the other whether I even agree with our precedent or not, because our precedent on that issue out of the Fifth Circuit is very different from the precedent of the 11th Circuit. And interestingly enough, the judge who wrote the decision for the Fifth Circuit on the social media issue and the judge who wrote the uh, decision in the 11th Circuit on the social media issue, which was which, which reviewing a Florida law that was similar, not exactly the same as the Texas law, were both appointed by Trump. Um, and I love to point that out to people because it just shows, hey, there's a, I mean, the word diversity comes to mind. There's a diversity of views on issues like this. Uh, free speech law is, um, do, doesn't always come down to the normal political uh, divide of conservative yeah. liberal or Republican Democrat. Uh, and that case in particular, if you read those opinions alongside, and I, I, you, you should read them. They're both very, very good and very well done. Um, that they are drawing on precedents from the past, say, a case about whether the government can tell a newspaper if you run an editorial by one candidate, you must run the opposing candidate's editorial on your page. A famous case where the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot force a private actor in a newspaper to do that. That's compelled forcing speech. them to speak. Yeah. Compelling speech. Yeah. Another case about setting up leaflets, distributing leaflets in a shopping mall. Now, um, or a case, uh, you know, a case about whether a, a gay rights group can be in, uh, can uh, can must be included in the St. Patrick's Day parade. This oh yeah, kind of the New York yeah. mm -hmm. um, These cases have nothing to do with social media or Twitter or whatever whatever we call these things. I, I you know, I joke with my kids, Instacart or whatever. Instagram. Insta mm -hmm. Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, a Snap. Yeah. Snap. Um, Snap Twitter, whatever. I, I say this. Me, yeah. I, I say this at at the table just to make my children. <laughs> I know it's not called that, um, but um, the the precedents. The, there are no precedents on these, and so we are in a sense we are we're you know we're, we have to well I guess we have to do what common law courts do. We have to reason by analogy from these other cases, sure. but applying sure. them in a very very different context and and in a context that involves. I mean, say what you will about these cases. The social media companies we're talking about are private actors, you know, and, and judging from the questioning of the justices um, in yesterday, these cases, yeah. uh, yesterday and in, and in the Texas yeah, and Florida very, cases very earlier, skeptical. there's some skepticism mm -hmm. there. And you have to understand that, of course, because typically when we're talking about free speech as, you know, as professional, as people who deal with this as part of their profession, we're talking about the government and whether the government can penalize. We're not talking about what people can say on the site formerly known as Twitter. And yet I understand, I think I've talked to one person who will remain nameless, who, who told me, well, you know, I'm on the Supreme Court of Twitter. You know, I, I, I judge things for, uh, for Twitter in some, uh, in some internal forum. I have no idea how that works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but evidently such a thing exists. Of course, my first thought was, can I get appointed to the Supreme Court <laughs> of Twitter? Because again, you know. Like the I'm, guy who's not, whose name is not McConnell? That, no, and, and, yeah. I, that I, and you, you, you have more freedom to say these things <laughs> than, I, than I do. But I bet, I, bet the, I bet the Twitter Supreme Court has better benefits than, than the U.S. Supreme Court. But all that is to say, these are very, very difficult cases. Ironically, that's what I was going to talk about at Stanford. Um, I was going yeah. to, all I was going to talk about, it was going to be a very innocuous speech, uh, kind of boring. And what I was going to talk about were cases in which the Fifth Circuit or circuit courts have to deal with these cutting edge issues where there are no precedents directly on point from the Supreme Court. And we are, in a sense, groping in the dark or reasoning by analogy. And what do we do? And I was going to contrast, for example, what the Fifth Circuit did in the Texas case with what the Eleventh Circuit did. Which, what does it come down to? They're both very, very smart judges who are writing these opinions. They are, they are disagreeing about how old precedents apply to new situations. They may, they may have uh, slightly different views about, uh, on judicial philosophy about what is the role of courts and, you know, in constitutional adjudication. What, what you know, should we, 
Should we have more of a presumption of constitutionality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not easy, and it's not this result-oriented judging where we say, well, I really don't like who's running Twitter these days, so I think they need to be reined in by the government. I think the public sometimes has this unfortunately crude view of judging in cases like this. Um, sometimes it's the fault of judges. Mostly it's the fault of the media, um, who I think report on the work that we do in a way that, ha that views it strictly in a political way. Uh, and, it, and I think that's very unfortunate, and yet I think the media has every right to do that. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, when you go outside the real core cases, you know, the government just straightforwardly punishing somebody for advocating for <clears throat> this political cause rather than that political cause, historically there has been interesting uh, non-ideological um, divisions are not ideologically based divisions on the court in these free speech cases. For example, the flag burning cases, mm. which are free speech cases. Yes. They're expressive conduct uh, cases. Texas against Johnson and Eichmann against the United States. And in both of those cases, and the question here was whether a state in the Texas case and whether the federal government in the Eichmann case uh, could actually ban, punish the burning of the American flag, the desecration of the American flag. And in both of those cases, the most liberal member of the court at the time, Justice John Paul Stevens, voted for the government, for the government's right to punish flag burning. The most conservative member of the court in those cases, Antonin Scalia, voted that the government could not punish the flag burning because it was protected speech, protected expressive conduct. I mean, if you, if you tell the standard ideological, political story, uh, you will miss these very interesting divisions uh, that are not ideological. And evidently, Justice Scalia's uh, wife, who I know was very unhappy with him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Maureen. Yeah, Maureen, God bless her. She's, uh, <laughs> she's, she's, a, she's a, as strong a personality as the, as the late Justice. May he rest in peace. But uh, you're right about that, and I think of some of the votes that Justice Alito has taken in free speech cases that mark out a sort of a different path. Uh, and it's hard, to, it's hard for me to sort of categorize why but he's taking a different path in certain free speech cases. I'm thinking again of Snyder versus Phelps. Yeah, he was a lone dissent in Snyder against Phelps. A lone Phelps. dissent. I'm thinking of the Crush video case. That, that oh, yes, that's exactly genre right. genre of speech that, I, that yeah. hurt, I, I, I devoutly wish did not exist of, of animals that are being crushed. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, this is United States versus Stevens, I think, is what it is. And the, yeah. the court um, invalidated that law. <coughs> Justice Alito would not have invalidated the law. Uh, so he's taking a different path in those cases, and it's, it's not a political valence to it. It's, it's a different appreciation of the values underlying freedom of speech, um, mm. and it's fascinating to, to see that. Uh, could, could I take you uh, into a um, different kind of territory sure. now, not the kind of thing you'll uh, likely be faced with on the court, so I hope you can speak very freely about, <clears throat> about this. I want to take you into the universities and the question of free yes, speech uh, in sure. the universities. We're blessed here to have the great Keith Whittington. It's actually here with us. Uh, oh, Professor Keith Whittington, my colleague and dear friend, who's literally written the book, yes, uh, Speaking Freely, Why Universities Must Protect uh, Freedom of Speech. Obviously, you've had direct personal experience in the university setting uh, with mm -hmm. uh, uh, speech. Uh, probably the biggest surprise to me now in my 39th year uh, as an academic is the way the academic culture has moved from being one in which free speech <clears throat> was cherished for the very reasons that Professor Whittington in the book reminds us of and tries to recall us to, to a situation where you know, free speech is now considered to be uh, a problem, a problem, and that, that, that there are restrictions that we have to, you know, or to legitimately may and really should place upon certain sorts of, uh, of uh, expression because it's, quote, harmful, uh, or uh, to recall the language used by the students at Yale in their famous confrontation with Professor Nicholas uh, uh, Christakis, mm -hmm. uh, you are disrupting life in my home, that the university is my home, and th uh, th this is making me feel very uncomfortable and unsafe, unsafe in my home. That's a genuine change. 
And again, for the reasons Professor Whittington articulates, uh, it seems to me that's a real danger to the mission of the university as a knowledge-seeking, truth-seeking, understanding-seeking uh, institution. Do you have a perspective of your own? I'm not asking you as a judge, but as a father, as someone who's been through the university system, um, what's your perspective on the situation for free speech in university? Well, I have a lot to say about that, um, and a lot of personal thoughts, as you say. I, I have children who are, um, one is in uh, college, she's a sophomore at Hillsdale, uh, one is going off to William & Mary uh, next fall. Maybe, maybe we'll be fortunate enough to send a child to Princeton, I don't know. Uh, we have three others. Um, after that, um, I think as a father, so let me talk as a father, because I remember seeing that Chris Dacus video. I don't watch many videos on, mm -hmm. online, and I've certainly never watched the Stanford videos myself. Um, uh, but as, as, a, as a father, I, I want to send my, I, I have two sort of thoughts and tension about that. I don't want to shelter my children from ideas that challenge them. Was that a danger with Hillsdale? That's a good question. No, it is not a danger at Hillsdale. Um, my son at Hillsdale is exposed to all sorts of, of, of ideas that challenge him, but it is in a, it's in an environment where he's being taught to engage constructively with those ideas. Um, I've never once heard my son say, oh gosh, I said something in class and Oh my, you know, my, my, my professor uh, disapproved of me and my, 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 uh, my friends were angry at me. And he's, he's reading all the great works uh, and they're engaging on all sorts of issues. Um, but I, I don't want to shield my children from being challenged, but I don't want to put my children in a position where they're being indoctrinated and coerced is the right word, into being silent and not speaking and having to watch what they say um, because um, they might be reported to the university. They might, they might be, you know, they might be called up for whatever you get, whatever you get, um, abusive speech, hate speech, whatever. Um, so those are two things. I, you know, I, I don't want my kids to live in a bubble, but I don't want, I don't want to send them out into an environment where they're going to be abused, frankly. They're going to be intellectually abused and come out of the process not able to think or engage well, but knowing what you should say and what you shouldn't say. Um, and I'm worried about, about sending kids out into the university, especially in the undergrad uh, uh, level, where they're not going to be taught, they're going to be indoctrinated. Uh, and that bothers me a lot. And like you say, you're seeing it from the inside. I'm seeing it from the outside. I, I, I spent a few years in a law school, but I'm not an academic. Um, I'm seeing it from the outside from thinking the whole purpose of a university is to teach students to think critically about the, the big issues, about the important issues in life. And you can't do that in an atmosphere where they're afraid to say the wrong thing. Um, and it's, it's really troubling. It influences where I think I'm going to send my children to school. Um, my, my son at William & Mary will probably have a different um, experience of academia than my son at Hillsdale. And if I send a son here or a daughter to wherever, UVA or something like that, she'll have a different experience as well. But I'm not going to send my child to a school where I know from talking to professors there or other students there where... If you say the wrong thing or you think the wrong thing, you're going to be ostracized. I would never, ever put a child in that situation. So those are my thoughts as a father. Um, it's interesting that students were saying to Professor Christakis that you are disturbing my home. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Well, I think it was responding to him saying, this is a university, and at a university, we put all ideas out there on the table and we debate them. Right. So their response is to his, this is a university, so we need freedom of speech. This is my home and I need to feel safe here. Yeah, and there we go back to safety. Yeah. Uh, and, the, I, I, and I'm not, I don't want, uh, my, 
I mean, I want my children to be safe from being mugged. No, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, I know. I know. Violence, agree harassment. With that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, want, I don't want my I don't want my daughter at a school to be afraid to walk around the school at night. Yeah. yeah. That's the kind of safety I'm interested in. Safety from an idea that challenges. I mean, look, I, I'm Catholic. I, I raise my children uh, to to be Catholic, to believe what the Catholic Church teaches. But if one of my sons or my daughter goes to a school and they say, "Well, you know the." You know, the, 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 the Catholic Church is a force of intolerance, and let's talk about the Inquisition. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to shield them from that. Yeah. I want, yeah. I want them to know how to constructively engage with that. Um, I don't want them to leave the church because of it, but I want them to understand where the person's coming from and how to engage with it. and. What are, what, are, what are some things that, that, that this person is saying that are true? And what are some things that are not true? Uh, that's what, that's yeah. what I want from my children. Let me share with you a concern that I have about the conservative response, the response of some of my fellow uh, conservatives mm -hmm. to the challenging situation now in the academy. Really, there are two examples here that I want to use. Uh, one is the provision of Florida's, I know it's in your in your well, it's 11th. No, it's 11th, right. So uh, the one is the provision of the Stop Woke Act in mm -hmm. Florida uh, that bans the teaching of certain theories right. or bans the teaching of critical race theory mm -hmm. or bans the teaching of divisive concepts. Sure. I, I think this could not be a, a more counterproductive response. I get why, mm -hmm. because they want to fight against indoctrination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the way to fight against indoctrination, it seems to me, is not to ban any point of view. It's to try to find ways to expand the exposure of students to the range of points of view, and really the best that's been thought and said on the competing sides sure. of different issues. Sure. Then the second example comes out of the now infamous testimony of the three presidents right. before uh, Congress, right. uh, the presidents, uh, two of whom have now fallen, mm -hmm. at uh, the presidents of Harvard, MIT, and, um, and, uh, and Penn. Um, now, those are private universities, so they're not bound by constitutional law. They're not bound by the Constitution, not bound by the First Amendment. Yet, like our university here, they have, to a very large extent, in their own internal rules, their internal law, uh, adopted First Amendment standards, with some exceptions, but by and large. And so, when, they, when the presidents were asked by uh, the New York representative, um, uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Stefanik, mm -hmm. uh, would calling for genocide against the Jews be a violation of Harvard's, Penn's, MIT's code of civility such that the student would be punished? They all responded by saying, it depends on the context. Is it? Now, here's the problem. Conservatives, and not just conservatives, were appalled by that and said, how can it depend on the context? an anti-Semitic statement, a call for the actual genocide of an entire ethnic religious uh, group, that's got to be beyond the pale. And yet, given the, the rules adopted by the universities, at least formally, rules which I myself support mm -hmm. and support here. We have the University of Chicago free speech principles. I'm glad we do. Um, given those rules, the answers the presidents gave were right. That was the correct answer. Mm -hmm. They were advised by their lawyers, and my old firm, actually, where I started out, uh, Hale and Door, now Wilmer really? Hale, yeah, Hale, yeah. Uh, advised them correctly on what the law was, and to the extent that they you know, mirror in their internal codes the, the, the U.S. constitutional law, the answers they give, it does depend on the context. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's an actual harassment or a direct mm -hmm. threat, yeah, then it can be punished. But if it's abstract advocacy, then it can't be punished, again, the Brandenburg a, a, a standard. Um, and yet, conservatives' reaction was essentially, well, wait a minute, you know, they punish racist speech, they punish uh, uh, speech that uh, criticizes um, LGBT ideology mm -hmm. and so forth, but all of a sudden they draw the line at anti-Semitic speech and they invoke the, the, the First right. Amendment. Now, I get why conservatives and others were outraged by that, but it shouldn't be because of the free speech standard. It should have been because of the hypocrisy. The problem with the testimony of the presidents was not that they gave the wrong answer. It does depend on context. It's that 
those universities had all persecuted members of their own, all three had, members of their own faculty and others who, who spoke on campus for speech offenses, which should have been protected under, the, where speech should have been protected under their codes. So it looked hypocritical for them suddenly, in the case of anti-Semitic speech, to invoke free speech principles. And it looked hypocritical because it was uh, hypocritical. But I think that still does not justify the response that would be, let's change our codes to broaden the protection for Jewish students, for conservative students, for Catholic students, so that we don't have these double standards. The answer is to, to me is to eliminate the restrictions on speech that, that you do in practice have, although in theory you're not supposed to mm -hmm. have. It's not to further restrict free speech. Well, look, I, I so you've, you've raised two things, sort of the conservative reaction to a campus speech climate that, that appears to disadvantage conservative disproportionately. And is that an overreaction and, and, and in its own way a hypocritical reaction? Because they, you, you, one might say the conservatives just want their own speech codes. Yeah, exactly. And, so now, and now I just, I just got finished saying I don't want a speech regime where I'm afraid what I'm going to say might violate the liberal, the, the progressive speech code. But the conservatives might come in and say now we're going to have a speech code and you're going to have to be worried that you're going to violate the conservative speech code. And in principle, I agree with you completely that that's, um, that's, that's uh, a medicine that's, uh, I don't know if it's worse than the problem, but it's a, it's, it's a cure that might kill the patient. And I would not be surprised, I don't know where those cases are in the 11th Circuit, but I would not be surprised if they're in the, uh, maybe they have they been enjoined already in part by the 11th Circuit. It's, it's going to be struck down. It's, it's, yeah. it's going to, those, those, I think you're right that those kinds of issues will create their own problems. And it is, a, it, it, for, not from a legal standpoint, but from sort of a free speech philosophical standpoint, it's misunderstanding the problem and applying the wrong cure to it. So I, t I, I think your point is well taken on that. Um, I would not want to be, a, I, I would, if I were a teacher in any university, I would not want to have to be looking over my shoulder and thinking, have I made a student feel bad on the basis of their race, or have now I made a student feel bad on the basis of their being white, which would be the conservative overreaction? You know, there are these 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 principles that say you can't make a student feel guilty because of their race. You know, yeah, these, these sorts yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how you apply that. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, that that's that's bad. So we'll see how the First Amendment applies to that, and and you may well be right that they'll be struck down. The university, I was asked at Villanova yesterday about this same issue, about the university president's testimony. And I have to say, my view of it is very close to your view. You have testified in front of Congress, no many doubt, times. many times. Mm -hmm. um, I had to testify in front of a congressional, in, in front of the, the Senate Judiciary Committee. For your confirmation. In order to get this job. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you may agree with me that when you are testifying in front of a congressional committee, that is a very different, that is a very different environment than, say, arguing a case in the yes, Fifth Circuit. Mm -hmm. And the quality of your answers, you have to, you have to think through, well, who's asking me the question, who is my audience, and what should I say as a result of it? So. The answer that it depends on context may well be accurate from a, if you were, if you were, if, if I asked you the question in the Fifth Circuit, or if Justice um, Sotomayor asked you the question in the U.S. Supreme Court. The quality of your answer, I think, if I were advising the university presidents, which I obviously wasn't, would have been, this isn't a court of law, nor is it a seminar on that, that, that Professor George is, is doing at Princeton. This is, a, this is a highly charged, politicized hearing, and your answer needs to speak to that. Um, I think there's all sorts of ways to give the same answer that the presidents gave that would not have been as controversial as they did. Um, but there was no getting around the hypocrisy. Oh, well, you know, the, the Carol Hooven case at Harvard, yeah, the Tyler yeah, Vanderbilt yeah. case, the Amy Wax case at, at uh, Penn, the Dorian Abbott case. Well, at you, could, you, could, you could repent. 
you could publicly repent. Repudiate them. them. You yeah, could exactly publicly right. repudiate yeah. the conversation. That's, I, that's what I, I would have been. I like. found I find in my in, in I found in my own Senate Judiciary Committee hearing once uh, that that actual humility uh, and apologizing goes a long way. People in Washington D.C. don't know how to react to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. I had a senator. I had a senator who was furious at me. Um, not because of anything I ever did, because I didn't know him, but because of something the White House had done and something the White House counsel had said to him that I sort of heard through the grapevine. And he was mad. He felt like he hadn't been sufficiently consulted. Uh, he was, his prerogatives as a senator hadn't been respected. And I knew where he was coming from. And so I apologized to him. Now, that didn't cost me anything. I hadn't done anything to him. But I just said, look, from, from my perspective, Senator, you seem offended, and I'm sorry that you had to be treated that way. And he didn't know what to say. <laughs> wow. um, and and I, that's, that's just because I'm not from Washington, D.C. <laughs> Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. Well, with, uh, with that, let's open the floor uh, to questions. Uh, is there a mic uh, runner? Yeah, you've got it up there. Uh, but I want to pause uh, for a commercial uh, advertisement. Uh, <laughs> We are being sponsored by Princetonians for Free Speech, which is really a wonderful group of uh, Princeton alumni. Uh, whether you're an alumnus or not, I urge you to acquaint yourself with their website. It's a wonderful source of information on free speech issues, especially in academia and most especially in, in, in Princeton. It's kind of a clearing clearinghouse and very valuable in that way. If you are uh, alumni of the university and you're not already a member of Princetonians for Free Speech, I would strongly urge you to, to be involved in doing the Lord's work, uh, helping us to maintain a campus environment that is faithful to the principles we've adopted, the University of Chicago Free Speech Principles, the, the gold standard. And I want to thank Princetonians for Free Speech for sponsoring the event. And with that, let me recognize uh, Brother Brian Zach uh, over here, who is an alumnus. I don't know if Brian's a member of Princetonians for Free Speech, but he should be. <laughs> thank you. Um, I actually agree with most of what you said, um, Robbie, which I'm really remarkable, uh, okay. amazed at. Yeah, um, I must but I appreciate it. But I do have two questions. I'll be as brief as I can. One is, you were focused, I think, uh, mostly on the legal aspects, what the law should or should yeah. not provide. And I'd like to know to what extent you feel that should be similar to or different from what a private organization, you alluded to it briefly, like a university or a company should provide in terms of their uh, requirements for those who work for them. Should Good you be question. able to f fire a professor because he says certain things like all Jews should be killed or something like that? And as a totally separate issue, which, which is, I think, more minor and more obvious, I'm wondering if you have any comments on what we should allow in terms of misinformation. Should we allow people to go around saying, yes, Trump won the, uh, the uh, election, that sort of thing. Yeah, the answer to the second question is very easy, which is yes, because I don't know the person I would trust to make the decision when it came to exercising the power of censorship and to punish people for incorrect or false opinions. I don't know the person I would trust in a university administration or especially in a governmental office to make the decision that this is misinformation and can therefore be censored and punished. If I'd ever meet that person, I might change my mind. But I doubt that in this life uh, I'm going to meet that person. Um, the, uh, on, the, on the first uh, question, this, this is interesting uh, territory and it requires a little bit of a more complex answer. And then I want to let Judge Duncan offer his perspective. Um, as I said, the Constitution does not apply to private organizations, businesses, or private universities. But the free speech internal rules of this university and many others to a considerable extent track U.S. constitutional law. So, for example, we have the University of Chicago free speech principles. We cannot, we, we, uh, the university cannot punish viewpoint-based uh, speech. It can impose time, place, and manner restrictions. It can stop you from, you know, going on to a, give it, having a soliloquy uh, about Shakespeare in the organic chemistry class. Uh, it, can, it can insist that you teach astronomy, not astrology. It can do things like that. Uh, there are also categories of unprotected speech, defamation, obscenity, fraud, uh, those kinds of things. So we're tracking the U.S. Constitution in all of those uh, areas. Um, 
So for all intents and purposes here, if speech is protected under, say, Brandenburg in the broad political sphere, it's protected here in our classrooms and in our public discussions, subject to the time, place, and manner rules and, and so forth. Uh, now, not all private universities have adopted um, as protective a regime of free speech as we have with the Chicago principles. Many have. In my view, not enough have. I'd like more to do it. But, but some allow themselves more room for, for restriction. Um, then there's another category, which are religiously affiliated private institutions. This is to be distinguished from non-sectarian or non-religiously affiliated ones like Princeton or, or, or Yale or Williams or Oberlin or places like this. Um, now, I've often lectured at those places, uh, Yeshiva, which is Jewish, uh, Brigham Young, I was just out there last week, and it was asked about this, or week before last, was asked about this very topic, which is uh, LDS, uh, Catholic ones like Notre Dame, Baptist ones like Baylor, Muslim, the new wonderful Muslim uh, liberal arts college in California, Zaytuna College, and at those places where I'm asked, I say, well, I'm a pluralist, I believe in a uh, 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 a lot of different kinds of universities, including religiously affiliated ones, I think they make an important contribution. And the rules won't be and can't be exactly the same when it comes to free speech and other issues at a religiously affiliated university that's serious about its faith. It won't be exactly the same as at, say, Princeton or a non-sectarian university. But when it comes to fundamental speech protection for the sake of knowledge seeking, of truth seeking, the rules will be much more like than different. So I do think you can insist, for example, it's legitimate for, say, Brigham Young University to insist that if you're going to be a member of the faculty, you have to sign on to our statement of faith. Um, uh, and you have to live by that statement of faith. That's, that's fine with me. But I say to the folks at Brigham Young, just said it as I say the uh, week before last, I say, but you will be doing your students a disservice if you treat this university as if it's a catechism class and fail to expose your students to critical perspectives, even on LDS, Latter-day Saints, Mormon, doctrine. So they should read Nietzsche, the most powerful modern critic of all religion, and especially Christianity uh, and Judaism. Uh, if they come out of this institution not having encountered Nietzsche and felt the power of some of his arguments, you have not educated them, that you have indoctrinated them. Now, there's a place for catechism class, but it's not in the university. You know, if little kid's growing up and you're bringing that, that child up as Catholic, let's say, the, teaching the kid what the Catholic Church believes is fine. If someone is being received into a new faith, they, they're, they're converting from one faith to another, having a catechism class in which they learn the teachings of the faith that they're coming into is, is fine. You need to. You might, it's better to know what you're signing up for than to not know. And we don't. I wouldn't insist that we have a debate about those things in the catechism class. So I'm, I'm not saying catechism class is never appropriate. I am saying it's never appropriate in something called a university, whether it's religiously affiliated or not. End of sermon. Um, so yeah, you know. yeah. That, that's. I mean, look. That, that's. I, I. I can't disagree with that. I happen to have the Chicago principles right here in front of oh, me. There as you go. Of fact. Um, and if I, were, if I were running a private university, I would think, well, we have a First Amendment in this country. Probably many of the principles that have been worked out in our free speech jurisprudence are worthwhile and would translate quite well into the university setting. Maybe we make an exception for this or that. Maybe the, you know, the, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be showing pornography in class. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, that sort of thing, even though that might be protected under the First Amendment. Um, we might have to we might have to, I, I would think um, the, the, a professor, while, while you don't want the professor having to watch everything he or she says, you want the professor facilitating dialogue in the class as opposed to sermonizing at students. Mm -hmm, yeah. you, so th that, that implies a restriction on the professor's speech, or maybe it's not a restriction, maybe it's just a a refinement of the speech. You're, when I've taught constitutional law and I've taught cases that I strongly agreed with or that I strongly disagreed with, but I don't want to 
I don't want to um, overwhelm the student by just giving, here are the 10 reasons why this decision is wrong. That's not teaching, that's indoctrinating. Instead, let's lead the student through the reasoning of the majority and the reasoning of the dissent and try to highlight where the good points are here and where the good points are here and try to facilitate yeah. some kind of understanding about the rationale. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to hire a clerk who had only been exposed to the, the indoctrination yeah, type of, of law teacher. Wouldn't be a critical thinker. It wouldn't yeah. be a critical yeah. thinker. It wouldn't be any use to me uh, uh, to, to tell me, to, to critique the arguments of my colleague who's, who's, who's written an opinion here and I need to know whether I should sign on to it or not. Mm -hmm, sure. um, I, I agree with you on the religious um, school. That's a much more difficult question. You, you, just because, I mean, I, look, I hire, I hire uh, kids from Notre Dame Law School regularly because I think they're, um, it's got a they're, great they're faculty. very it's good. A great law school. It's got a great faculty. But I don't think they're just having Catholic catechism class. Oh no, no, no! no. Uh, at uh, in the in the law school, those no, those kids know how to think. Just go to faculties we have in the country. Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent faculty. On the misinformation point, I have to say m misinformation. The term I put in the same category as hate speech. What is it? What is it? I mean, I understand when when someone says it. Oh, it's misinformation. Trump says he won. He didn't. He didn't lose the election, but he did. So what they mean is lying. Okay. Great. Under our basic free speech principles, the way to expose lying is to expose the person who's lying as a liar and say, nope, you're wrong. And here's 27 reasons why you're wrong. Um, you know, I, I might point out that, that, you know, no case that ever went to court actually vindicated any, any of those theories uh, that you're talking about. Uh, but again, what you said is where my mind always goes. Let's agree in principle that there is such a thing as misinformation and that somehow we can define what it is in some broad way. You still need the misinformation prosecutor and the misinformation judge. And who are those people? I don't know. I don't know them. And I'm sitting here as a judge and you shouldn't trust me. <laughs> you don't want to know what I think is misinformation and what I don't think is misinformation. We probably wouldn't agree on it. And it'd be better, in my view, to leave that off the table. Um, and uh, I get very nervous with, with uh, the, this talk about misinformation. It's also not a category of speech that I'm, that I'm aware of. That's right. Uh, we have a question. Uh, oh, uh, can I go over there and then I'll come back over here, sir? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah he, he's going to bring you the mic. That, that way we'll catch the question on the video. <clears throat> Great hat by Cat, by the way. We'll Thank you. I wore it so that I would draw your attention. You did it, <laughs> um, this, There are many uh, points at which a difference of free speech over the, the topic of, of free speech should be permitted. And I was wondering if there's a connection between that and the, how our various levels of government have gone beyond their constitutional boundaries and we're deciding things that really shouldn't be decided on a, a, a societal level. Okay, what a great question. And of course, the, the, in this term, the Supreme Court is uh, gonna be taking up some cases that have to do with whether, especially the national government has exceeded its constitutional, in, in the case of the national government, delegated powers. Yeah, let me, uh, let me see if I understand. Yeah, why don't you do that? Give me, I, I, it's always better to talk about concrete things as long as they're not my case. Uh, well, one of, the, one of the things that triggered my question was the, the so-called book banning. Mm -hmm. So in concept, banning a book is bad. In concept, not letting a parent decide the educational principles of their children is bad. This is an instance of two wrongs don't make a right. Does that help? Yeah, that, that does help. I mean... It is, when you're deciding a case of that nature, um, you, 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 never can, you never can use a broad principle like book banning is bad, and then just sort of derive the result. We're, we're, we, have to, we have to approach it from such a more sort of granular, concrete level. What setting are we talking about? Are we talking about a public library? Are we talking about a... Uh, a school library? Are we talking about a bookstore? What, what are we talking about? And who is making the decision? Obviously, some speech is being restricted. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a case. So who's restricting the speech? Um, 
on what ground do they say that they're restricting the speech? Um, you know, and then what do the precedents say about this? You know, at what level of government are we talking about? Are we talking about the federal government, which is, yeah, well, it, it depends. It, it, it's different, right? Uh, the federal government should be a government of, of enumerated powers, right? And, they have, and, and Alexander Hamilton famously said, we don't need a First Amendment for the federal government because the federal government has no power to ban speech at all. Yeah, the Constitution the itself, he said, is for all intents and purposes a, a Bill of Rights. Right. Um, now, that, was, that view was not vindicated because that's in the Federalist Papers and a Bill of Rights was, was adopted. Yeah, added, yeah. Um, are we talking about, I mean, many of our cases are about local governmental bodies. Um, and then you think, all right, I, I always think this, who is going to decide this question? Because the knee-jerk answer for the federal judge is, the federal judge is going to decide the question, right? Because the federal judge knows best. In that regard, I am sort of like the kid who got elected to be student body president on the platform of abolishing the student body, <laughs> uh, the student government. Because I am, I think it is correct for me to be highly mistrustful of the power that I wield. Because I, I wield power, like it or not, right? I wield a power called the judicial power under Article Three of the Constitution. That is a particular kind of power. It is not legislative power. And when I find myself, let, let's say hypothetically without talking about any case in, a, in the book banning context, and I find myself thinking, I know how to decide this question. I'm going to come up with a 15 part test that involves all of these very, very difficult to apply tests and considerations. And I think to myself, is this the judicial power that I'm exercising? Or is this the legislative power oh, yeah. that I'm exercising? Or is this more, do, am, I, am I all of a sudden acting like the member of the Library Commission of X County in Texas? And if I start asking myself that, I start having doubts about whether I'm deciding the case correctly. I have to say, I, don't, I, I admire all my colleagues, especially the ones that, that vigorously disagree with me. But if I could point to one divide and it might be a generational divide, although I do see sort of Reagan era judges who sort of take this view too. It's, it's to be mistrustful of the decision-making power that we're using as judges and to sort of draw back from that. Justice Scalia, was this was very, very big for Justice Scalia. And I think it goes a long way to even explain the decisions that, like Smith, where the, 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 the infamous peyote case that, that displeased many people, across the many, many spectrum, religious yeah. people and many non-religious people, that he was very, very mistrustful of judges weighing things. In that case, that weighing... That seemed legislative. Yes, it seemed yeah. legislative and it seemed like it, it couldn't have an answer. Or he might say, channeling William F. Buckley, why should I be doing it? Why shouldn't you know, the first hundred people in, in, uh, in, in Hidalgo yeah. County yeah. Be, be doing it? So that's a long way of saying th that's what I think when I'm deciding cases, especially speech cases, which often turn on these very fine distinctions. And I ask myself, why should it be me deciding that? This very patient gentleman right uh, over here. Could you give him the mic? Yeah. Hello. Um, you mentioned, uh, Professor George, uh, you mentioned time, place, and manner restrictions. Right. And what I've noticed maybe over the last 10 years, especially the last five years, is the extensive use or overuse or abuse of time, ma time manner, and place restrictions. Uh, you see it at the local government level in terms of public comment periods being removed from public meetings or time restrictions, what used to be unlimited time, down to five minutes, down to two minutes. You can barely get through an introduction and your, your time is called. I also see it in the universities now, especially very recently with the, the Israel-Palestinian right. protests. Absolutely right. Columbia has done some things recently very restrictive in terms of what they're, they're allowing. And so, you know, it's, it's easy sometimes to say, you know, we have free speech subject to time, place, and manner restrictions, but I'm seeing in a very stealthy way these being extended in a, you, they're not headline items like some of the other topics you've discussed, but they're there and they're being extended. And I'm, I'm curious what your reaction is to that. There's a very negative reaction to that. 
because I think this is an abuse. We do need to have room for time, place, and manner restrictions. It's obvious that we do. Um, there's no problem. It's got to be protected that we uh, would allow a sound truck uh, to drive through the down Nassau Street in the center of Princeton at 3 in the afternoon, blaring out, vote for RFK. It's fine, right? We, we would be appalled that any, whether we're for Senator or, uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. or not, we would be appalled if the government forbade that or restricted that. But by the same token, we would not want, we would not want the government to allow that sound truck to drive through the western section of Princeton, different place, at three o'clock in the morning, different time, blaring out with the sound truck, the manor, vote for RFK. Because that would be crazy and it would be disturbing the peace and people wouldn't be able to sleep. That's, that, those are the legitimate time, place, and manner uh, regulations that we need. The abuse is when people use time, place, and manner as an excuse, as a pretext for suppressing speech they don't like or suppressing speech on subject matters where they don't want speech on the subject matter. In universities, the worst kind of abuse I've seen is where instead of the university being the forum for free speech and there being small pockets like in a classroom where you can put time, place, and manner restrictions on like in astronomy class, you can't talk about Shakespeare, and so forth and so on. Instead, now we get free speech zones, which are the little carved out areas where you have free speech, and the rest of the campus speech is restricted, either on a subject or sometimes even a particular viewpoint. And that's outrageous, and it not only undermines free speech values, it undermines the values for the sake of which we value free speech. For example, in the university setting, the need to try to get at the truth of things by letting the idea, uh, the clash of ideas uh, occur. So you two have got me sermonizing, I'm afraid, but you're absolutely right. And this is a bad thing and it's an abuse. Here, here I belong to the church of, of Robbie George. Um, and then I, this is, if this is an altar call, I'm gonna come down <laughs> to the altar. Uh, at this, judges are not dumb uh, by and large, and these these time, place, and manner that built into that analysis is the idea that they can't be used as a pretext. Uh, and, and I can't think of a particular case, in, and it's be probably better that I don't. But the, these these sorts of tests, I, I'm I'm skeptical about tests in general, uh, because tests, as you're as you're suggesting, tests can often be used as a pretext for deciding something. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm test skeptical. I'm certainly multi-factor test skeptical. And it, it, it's, it's one thing to say it's a time and place and manner restriction. That, to me, that's the beginning of the analysis. And then I analyze it and say, okay, is this really that or is this something else? Um, uh, and I think the, the, the jurisprudence here is, is flexible enough to ferret out these kinds of pretextual uses. And I certainly hope it is, because that's what, what Robbie's talking about is an obvious abuse. We have time for one more question. Who would like to? Oh, the, this young lady right here. Yeah, excellent. I wanted a student question at some point. Uh, she, she's down here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, should speech being spread over the internet be treated any differently than other forms of speech? just because it can be spread so quickly to so many people? I mean, so yes, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that a, a student asked a question and it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, because it, with the internet, I really don't know. I go back and forth on whether it's changed everything about speech or whether we just apply our old, free, our old speech principles to the internet or has it materially changed What's going on in speech? I really don't know. I think it's one of these areas where the courts are still trying to catch up on, I mean, the internet's been around for a while, and yet there's just not many good cases on, I, I'm not even sure the, the judges and the justices even know how to conceive of the internet. I was just, you should read, you should go to um, the website. You can go and listen to oral arguments in the Supreme Court, uh, sometimes in real time these days. Maybe always in real time. If you're a fellow of the James, undergraduate fellow of the James Madison program, you can do what our students did today, 
which is they, they were down there attending an oral argument as the guests of Justice oh, no Elena Kagan, uh, and then met with the justice uh, for a 45 minute or hour discussion after the oral argument. So, yeah, come to or, Princeton and sign so up. If you're a very important person, you can do that. <laughs> if you're nobody like me, you go on the internet and you listen to the oral argument. And you can listen to the justices. And the justices are not all these 80 year old folks, they're young people too. Um, I mean, they're my age. Uh, <laughs> That's young. And, and they're grappling with what is this thing, this internet or this social media? What does it mean for speech? And, and it's, it's tough. It's very, very difficult. Um, so, I mean, the, the fact that it spreads everywhere so quickly, isn't that a great thing? Well, sure, it's a great thing. Isn't that a terrible thing? Sure, it's a terrible thing. Uh, if we're talking about the incitement test, we're talking about, well, if you, can, if, you can, um, if you can punish inciting speech because you've, essentially the speech has lit, has lit the fuse on the powder keg and it's about to explode and you know it's going to and it's likely going to, well, what is the, is the internet just like a big powder keg? I don't know. I can think of examples where the internet, Facebook, whatever we call it these days, has been used for great purposes to help democratic revolutions around the world. And then I can think about what percentage of the internet is pornography. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to say about it. There is that old adage that um, the lie will be halfway around the world before the truth gets, you know, two steps gets out of bed. before it gets out of bed. Um, and that, that adage was uh, developed before there was an internet. So now it can be the whole way around the, around the world. And yet, who would we trust? What official, high or low, yeah. would we trust Michael McConnell, to apparently. be the czar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, to be the czar, to, to be the prosecutor, to be the, the judge of what counts as the, as the lie. Never I think forget that question that, that, that Professor George has said. Yeah. It's never, these, these things never happen in the abstract. They're all, somebody has to decide them. Uh, and we, we know from our form of government that we don't trust people so much. It's not that we don't like people, it's that we know people. Uh, <laughs> you can read about what people are like in the 10th Federalist paper. So read Federalist 10 and you will get a very if we were governed by Calvinistic, people. Calvinistic view of, uh, of, of human nature and why we can't trust anybody with unchecked, unlimited, unaccountable power. That's the whole genius behind the Madisonian system. It's, it's restricting and limiting power, making sure power is checked, making sure officials are accountable for the power that they exercise. And with that, let me uh, thank uh, Matthew X. Wilson for introducing us. Princetonian for uh, free speech, sign up. And let me ask you now to join me in thanking Judge Kyle. Thank you, Kyle.